Hey, Adam. Here we go. We're live. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I've been reading your watch list investing newsletter. And even though I love Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I realized in reading your super comprehensive newsletter that there's still way more that I've yet to learn and understand about fully valuing the conglomerate behemoth that is Berkshire Hathaway. So I greatly appreciate your time in walking me through your newsletter and valuation method of Berkshire so that folks who are listening out there, if you love Berkshire Hathaway as much as Adam and I do, this could be a tremendous help in helping all of us be better investors, especially if we're interested in investing in Berkshire Hathaway. So thank you again, Adam, for talking with me today. No, oh, you're welcome. It's it's great to talk with you, Michelle. And uh, you know, I love talking about Berkshire. And I think the the more people that know more about it and really understand it, um, the better. And you know, Warren says when he he dies, he wants to be remembered as a teacher. And I think you know, just teaching is something I I enjoy too. So uh, teaching in Berkshire Hathaway, and you know, can't get any better than that. So happy to. Happy to dive in. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, um, you know, where where do you want to start? So I've got, you know, we uh, you, you mentioned the newsletter, which I have up here in, on the screen. Um, you said comprehensive. And I, I guess it, at 42 pages, it, it is it is quite in depth. Um, although for someone who wrote a 750 page book, 42 pages seems like, you know, uh, a, a breeze but um i think reading this you know what i try to do is is enough enough to really get to understand all of berkshire sort of as it is because it, it is i mean it's a big company it's a conglomerate it has a lot of different operating parts but sort of when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it uh it's fairly straightforward to to value and as long as you understand it and then understand the background of the company a little bit and understand sort of the characteristics of the business you always want to equate the numbers to to actually what what's producing those numbers right so you're not surprised or they, they make sense to you so um certainly this newsletter th this newsletter was published last year I'll, I'll be putting out an update um this year as well and you know has a lot of the history goes through uh of a brief history of early conglomerates how berkshire's different how it was structured um some of the things that warren and charlie learned from the early uh, the early days a little bit of berkshire's sort of full history but i guess and we can we can bring up any of that you know sort of as we go along mm -hmm. um but i guess you know sort of where it comes down to okay how do you value this beast mm -hmm. um bunch of different methods uh the the most common that you'll find are the four that I have here. Some of the parts, gap adjusted financials, uh, the two column method, and the price simple price to book. Those are kind of the four methods. They are very similar to one another. They sort of interrelate and should be consistent. And you know, I show that in this this uh, analysis. I think to kind of keep it simple and and highlight, you know, even the one that I use. We can we can walk through the sum of the parts, which really will give you give you a good idea of those sources of value for Berkshire. And okay. um, and and quick question with some of those. So I see you have four main valuation methods listed of some of the parts, gap adjusted financials, two column method, and price to book. And and while today we'll focus on some of the parts, do you mind just giving like a one line explanation of what some of those other types of methods aim to get at more so than maybe like how they how do they differ a little bit yeah no that's that's good to start there so some of the parts is you break up berkshire into several different components and say okay what is bucket a b c d and so on what what are those worth and then add them up mm -hmm. uh, gap adjusted financials works with this sort of the same starting information but it starts with um uh, you know starts with the income account okay you know uses some of the balance sheet numbers like cash is cash you know we can we can value that um 
you know, at a hundred percent, that's, that's pretty straightforward, but, you know, to, to get beyond the accounting, for example, Berkshire is required to put changes in its equity portfolio from quarter to quarter through the income statement. So Mm -hmm. adjust that back out, make some adjustments for earning power of say the insurance operations, make adjustments for non-cash charges, true non-cash charges like amortization, things like that, where you're, you're just adjusting the bottom line of the financials, adding back perhaps the uh, look through earnings of some of the investments. So for example, Berkshire might get dividends from some of its investees, but those are only the dividends, right? Those companies earned more. So you add that to the earning power mm-hmm. and come up with a number um, for the whole of Berkshire and capitalize that at some multiple. The, okay. the, the two column methods, again, they're, they sort of all relate. Uh, the two column method is actually uh, uh, an approach that Buffett himself put forward, I think probably starting in the mid 90s and just said, you know, hey, look, we have investments. Uh, per share and he always looked at things per share because uh, some of the early conglomerates would grow by just issuing shares and uh, his his philosophy is things you, you, shareholders get get create wealth on a per share basis so you know you really need to look at it like that if you're not diluting the company and so forth so per share investments and then per share operating earnings as a as the two sources of value for Berkshire okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, he would track those year by year and say, you know, they're going to be lumpy and so forth. So that's, that's, that's the two column method. And then price to book is, um, kind of a shorthand, uh, back of the envelope, uh, sort of cheating way of saying, okay, Berkshire has traded at X price to book in the past. And, you know, it generally should be in this range, right? kind of assumes that you've done the work or others have done the work and that an appropriate price to book value exists. Um, Now you got to understand that as Berkshire buys more businesses and maybe has more goodwill on the books that the appropriate price to book today is probably different than it was. It definitely is different than what it was 20 years ago. So you still need to understand, but it's just kind of another gut way of, of looking at Berkshire to say, okay, you know, one time's book strong buy, you know, you, it, it should not trade that low mm-hmm. three times book value, which it hit a couple times in its history, probably getting a little ahead of itself. Um, mm-hmm. So, so those are the, those are the four. I think the sum of the parts is best because you're you're actually doing the analysis. You know, you're getting into the weeds. You're getting into, all right, here are the components. You know, they operate differently. There's there's certain aspects of Berkshire Hathaway that make having all of these components actually worth more together. But from a, a straight sort of valuation standpoint, you can say, okay, the energy business is worth X, this, investments are worth Y, you know, just, just really break it up. So that's, that's where I think it's more advantageous and you really get sort of more out of. And, and if, you know, pick, picking one, I think that's the best way to start at least. Um, mm-hmm. And do you have to add somewhat of a conglomerate discount because the market may not fully um appreciate all the individual parts that make up the sum of you know it always seems like um if if something is big and maybe looks complex on the outside people may not fully give it the full value as if you might have if you spun off some of these things and if they were their own individual companies they might garner higher market value so kind of wondering how do you adjudicate for some of that yeah i I touch on that in the book um, th- there are definitely things about Berkshire that make it worth more together. I mean, they can move capital from one subsidiary to another without any tax consequences. Um, having the insurance business, they're able to do, uh, take more volatility in the insurance business because they have some of the stable businesses like utilities, like a railroad, um, which the, the railroad, uh, some people may not know is actually owned by 
national indemnity, which is uh, was Berkshire's very first insurance business. It's one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Uh, but the, but an entire railroad sits on the books mm-hmm. of national indemnity, which provides this stable earning power. So so the insurance business is able to take on higher volatility, longer term uh, risks that an insurance business that was writing a bunch of business just by itself could not. So there's there's definitely things that make Berkshire worth more, actually worth more having mm-hmm. all these pieces together. Um, I take the approach and what I say in my book is the source of value long-term is all of the cash that these assets are gonna generate over their life. Just because someone is willing to pay more of a multiple today does not mean that it should be broken up because you're just saying, okay, if someone wants to pay some crazy number for C's candy, you know, let's go sell that off. Well, now you've sold off this incredible asset. Mm-hmm. You don't have those cash flows over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so that's sort of even just the explicit Berkshire would be worth less broken up because cash cash flows earning power is what creates value and i would just say that you know i would disagree with the valuation you know that that conglomerate the conglomerate discount maybe exists maybe doesn't um i don't factor anything in like that i i just say okay here's here's what i think this collection of assets is worth this series of cash flows um and um so I don't, I don't, I don't try to try to do any of that. Okay, that's cool. That's good to know. I, I appreciate that, um, you know, knowing that because I just wonder how some people tend to look at either Berkshire and or other conglomerates, and if they, you know, kind of, you know, adjust for that depending on what someone's investing philosophy is. And and the other question I had was with price to book. I know that even though Buffett used to talk more about book value like in in starting off a lot of his annual letters and saying Berkshire's book value was this last year and then in more recent years he's gone away from that and so I wonder how how do we also reconcile that part about Berkshire's book value and how Buffett seems to have changed his opinion on its um, usefulness or applicability Mm -hmm. no it's a good question and and just a final thought on the uh, the conglomerate piece Mm -hmm. a big part of Berkshire is buying these businesses and holding them for keeps and so a big part of its its reputation and even its future ability to attract acquisitions comes from the fact that it buys for keeps and so you would by breaking it up or spinning things off you would you would lose that permanent home for some of these businesses and okay right. now Berkshire is just like any other pri- private equity firm so i think there would be a real detriment in value uh, mm-hmm. if, Berkshire started doing that uh, with the price to book. So the reason why Buffett sort of he he went from book value as sort of a a rough guide to value uh, to using market value is because of what I talked about before. So um, a business like Seas Candy, for example, that has increased its you know it it was purchased for twenty five million dollars in nineteen seventy two. Mm-hmm. Well, the only way that that business increases its book value is if it retains cash or builds up assets on its retained earnings on its balance sheet. Anything that's distributed or its earnings power. So when 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 Buffett first uh, purchased it, um, sees I think earned around four million dollars a year. Well, okay. If that business, and we don't have current figures because it's so buried inside Berkshire, but if that business is earning, you know, a hundred million, hundred and fifty million dollars a year, no one capitalizes that. You know, just use a rough ten times multiple. The, the value of forty million when they bought it to a billion or a billion and a half today doesn't show up anywhere on Berkshire's books mm. as they distribute the cash, and so mm-hmm. you have this discrepancy between the the book accounting of these businesses and then their earnings power that is has 
in some cases gone down, but presumably has an aggregate gone up. And so the appropriate price to book should actually increase over time. Um, it's just as as the businesses mature, as as Berkshire has gone more into wholly owned businesses versus marketable securities, marketable securities get marked to market every quarter. It's pretty, you know, it's reflected in, in the book value. So as that gap between uh, the, 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 the book value on the day of purchase and then maybe what, what they're worth based on earnings power has changed, Buffett said, yeah, th this, this doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, a lot of people, myself included, will still still calculate it. It's still sort of a rough proxy for for valuation, but that's the reason why why he went away from from doing that. Yeah, so it seems like it doesn't fully capture the actual, like say, full intrinsic value of Berkshire itself, like of of the fact that C's Candies and a lot of wholly owned subsidiaries are big cash producing machines and and that gets a little bit uh maybe lost or or not as fully recognized based on current accounting measures yes i mean look at geico i mean they they purchased the whole of geico in 1996 and again the the earnings power of that just keeps going up float has gone gone up dramatically over time which which is a huge source of value doesn't show up on the books anywhere, you know, and mm. so it it loses its relevance over time. Um, I use I use the example in uh, my book of, you know, if if there was a silver dollar, you'd say, okay, this this silver dollar, its its headline value is one dollar, right? Mm. But if the price of silver means that the silver content is actually worth a dollar fifty well now the appropriate price to book value is a dollar fifty so mm -hmm. one and a half times book value so it's very simplistic but you know the the face value of berkshire is that is that silver dollar okay it's worth one dollar right but look look below the surface and you have this wonderful collection of businesses this precious metal if you will to, to continue the analogy it's mm -hmm. actually worth it's actually worth more so that's that's why sort of not looking deeper, you know, if someone said, okay, well, I'm just going to look at price to book and I'm not going to go any deeper. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend that approach, but as a rough proxy and kind of a reconciling measure and, and looking at it over time. Yeah. That's you're okay. You're in the ballpark. Yeah. And, and I mean, I would imagine price to book is still um, more acceptable with something like Berkshire because they do have, a huge amount of assets like they like more hard assets as opposed to say a software as a service business that's more intangible so maybe you can still also incorporate that from from that perspective i would guess yeah there's a little bit of that i mean certainly again the, the mark to market uh things like cash is carried at at cash um marketable securities are marked to their their fair, fair value at the end of the quarter so that's that's a big chunk of the value and then like you said you have utility businesses the railroad you know those things are more asset heavy that would sort of retain retain their value but but even there you know um like the railroad you know if you put down a, a rail some of those assets are are 100 year assets well you know, if, if if there's a a stretch of track or right of way that's on the books for whatever price, twenty five, fifty years go by. Well, you know, odds are that that's going to have a higher replacement value. So you, you could even argue this is getting sort of deep into it, but that the earnings power is overstated because you're not depreciating it correctly. But the the book value of those assets would actually be understated. Right. right? Um. So. Yeah. These are sort of some of the nuances that come out when you, you start to unpeel the, peel back the onion, if you will. Right. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, with, with that, I think that gives a pretty comprehensive flavor of some of the things to consider with valuing Berkshire. And and so if it's all right with you, maybe we start looking into the some of the parts method that you've used here. Yeah, so, so I've got, so this is the newsletter again. This was... Uh, it's almost a, a year old, but subscribers uh, just a couple of uh, probably a few months ago, 
uh, I put my valuation model uh, on on the website. So su subscribers have access to this spreadsheet, which I update quarterly, which shows my some of the parts valuation for Berkshire. So <clears throat> um, again, breaking it down, it's it's kind of intimidating at first to say, okay, here's this huge conglomerate with half a trillion dollars worth of equity capital and pushing a trillion dollars worth of assets. How do you go about valuing this thing? And so like any analysis, uh, you just start breaking things apart. Um, and so, you know, we were talking beforehand uh, about cash and, you know, I kind of just quickly said, well, geez, okay, cash is cash, but, uh, I'll walk you through how I think about it. And so um, just to, to where this number came from, this 105 billion, 201 million. So I have Berkshire's third quarter report here. And so go right to the balance sheet. This is a consolidated balance sheet. I, I, I typically, and Buffett has even said, you know, this, this balance sheet, this level you, you can't just go off of this because it's just a roll up of everything. So that's one of the reasons why we break it out into the component parts, because looking at all of this, there's so many different, there's, there's literally hundreds of businesses within Berkshire, but even, even if you break it out into the half a dozen or so that, that we'll look at, you have to really understand the component parts, uh, but cash, we can get off of this. Now, if we look under, uh, the assets section right here, it gets, it's not as straightforward because they have cash and equivalents right here. That's okay. There's cash, uh, mm -hmm. for accounting purposes. They have to, they have to have, uh, treasury bills listed separately. So the, uh, the, the 105 billion that I have for that number is simply the sum of these two numbers right here, cash and equivalents and the treasuries. Now, I, I will caution that that's insurance and other, and this is just, again, to show you, other would be, you know, a high-ranking Fortune 500 company, um, Berkshire listed as other. Um, <laughs> uh, so it, it, wow. there's a lot in that number. Yeah. So that's, so it's, it's grouped into two segments, insurance and other, and railroad utility and energy. I don't count the cash in the rail or utility business. My reasoning is those businesses need operating capital. It's never really cash that can sort of be used. It's part, I'm capturing that asset just like I would with, you know, say property plant and equipment, a, a, a locomotive or a, a utility plant or something. I'm capturing that value in the operations when I capitalize the earning stream. So I'm ignoring that. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like, like a, in a consumer point of view, it's sort of like having some money in your checking account to pay for bills, but it's not like the other cash you have set aside for investing or like in a bond or something like that. Yeah, it's 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 a it's an operating asset of of those businesses. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at you know, some of the financial websites, or you might see the financial press, they will add all of the cash and it's not wrong. It's just, okay, how are you going about uh, doing it? Now, if this number, you know, it's, it's been fairly consistent over time, it's sort of, it's sized to those businesses. If that, if that number was huge for some reason, you know, if it was 10 or $15 billion, you could then say, okay, I don't think that level is appropriate. I think there's excess cash and I would, I would add it, but for, you know, it, it's very, uh, that's sort of getting into the weeds. You, you can really mm -hmm. just use those two, those two figures there. So, so cash, cash and treasuries, those are going to be worth what they're going to be worth. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, it's a pretty meaningful, uh, meaningful value. So then, then we move on to the, the fixed maturity portfolio, which are simply the bonds. And here again, I just take the number right from the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. 
you could get cute and say, okay, well, I'm going to look at, you know, interest rates have gone up and maybe the value of the bonds has gone down a little bit. I don't think that's necessary. It really, it's going to represent a couple of percentage points of valuation, the ultimate valuation that you're going to, you're going to get. So not appropriate or, or not worth going into that level of detail. You probably wouldn't yield much in terms of uh, analytical value. So that's where that number mm-hmm. comes from. Okay. Those are, those are again, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we go down, we sort of get into here's, here's where other analysts, um, you know, you might disagree. Someone else might do it a little bit differently. I'm going to, I'm going to present the way I do it, you know, feel free to, you know, think, think it should be different or, um, we're all going to be pretty close, but you know we, we all might do it a little bit differently. So this three hundred and six billion for the equity investments again just comes right, right from the balance sheet. Right. Investment in equity securities. Now, oops, you do need to be conscious of what's in there. Now Berkshire is not generally going to have you know a wildly overvalued portfolio sometimes it might be undervalued you might want to make an adjustment for that but you you want to make you want to at least consider valuation of that portfolio so Mm -hmm. some analysts will say okay i'm just going to make i'm going to look at every single business under the portfolio so i'm going to actually value american express i'm actually going to value apple i'm actually going to apple uh value coca-cola and you know all of these businesses where you can get the information from berkshire's filings if they have to file something called a 13f every quarter Mm -hmm. discloses what holdings they have some analysts will will get even more fine-grained and say okay like I'm just looking at it as of the quarter end. Yeah. You you could go to a live spreadsheet of okay, we know at the end of the quarter Berkshire owned this many shares of this company, go all the way down the line and say, okay, mm-hmm. well, the share price has changed. I'm gonna change that number. You wouldn't be wrong in doing that. I just think it gets a little, you know, it's gonna fluctuate up and down over time. I'm more concerned. Yeah. If I'm more concerned about the valuation of major pieces within the portfolio, so I will eyeball the list of investments that Berkshire has. Mm-hmm. Um, CNBC does a great job. They have a you know if you search, I think uh, CNBC you know Berkshire portfolio, it'll come up, and they actually have a live spreadsheet of all of the holdings, up to date market values. It's it's pretty neat. Um, I'm more I I care more about but checking evaluation and then the big numbers fortunately with berkshire i mean over its history berkshire has sort of made an increasing number of big bets over time uh, which is really interesting I mean, even going back to its, its early history it has made large investments as a percentage of its equity capital over and over and over again to the point of now we have apple you know mm-hmm. at um at a huge portion of of the investment portfolio. So what I've done here, and this may change, it's not just Apple, but you know, for, for this, these last two quarters, I wanted to gut check Apple. And I just said, okay, very simple. Here's Apple's trailing 12 months uh, net income. I think 20, a 20 times multiple is not inappropriate. Again, you might disagree and that's fine. So I think Apple's roughly worth, you know, $2 trillion. Add in the cash equivalents. Add in they have some marketable securities, some investments on the on the books. Um, evaluation again, rough. Just gut check, two point one trillion, um, and then just compare that to what the market value is here. So so right right, and hopefully my screen shows this. I, I have this implied over or under valuation. Mm-hmm. I just said, you know what? For a, a company that's worth, I think is worth roughly two point two point two trillion dollars. 
38 billion, 77 billion, pretty close. I don't mm-hmm. really need to make an adjustment. If I came mm-hmm. up with Apple, you know, if, if the market price was 4 trillion, I'd probably mm-hmm. want to cut some of that off. Or conversely, if it was trading at 10 times earnings, I still thought the quality of the business was, was good. Maybe I'd increase it. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of come away with the feeling that there's pretty concentrated portfolio within Berkshire, but roughly speaking, given the management that is there, Buffett himself, Todd Combs, Ted Weschler, they're going to keep that portfolio at a pretty, uh, pretty close to intrinsic value or, or under intrinsic value because that's what they're they're being paid to do to to actively manage the portfolio. So I probably won't be far off in using uh, the overall value. So so I've I've gone through this exercise and said from a pure valuation standpoint. I'm okay with 306 billion. I can count that as value. Okay. What I do make an adjustment for is deferred taxes. So, and, and I'm happy to sort of get into the get into the weeds here. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go to let's see here, um, let's search let's search Apple. So, Berkshire, right in its filings, will have investments in equity securities here's that 306 billion well they've broken it down into cost basis of 142 billion and gains of 164 billion and then mm-hmm. they also have here 73 percent of the portfolio was in five companies right so I, I will look at that you know if i look at american express apple bank of america coca-cola uh and chevron mm-hmm. gut check is the market crazy on any of those names? Are they undervalued? That's what I use to say. I want to. I want to look at this a little bit deeper and make an adjustment. I don't. I don't think it's worth the time for me to value every single stock in Berkshire's portfolio. It just. It's just not worth it. There's mm-hmm. going to be ups and downs. That mitigating. Uh, some are going to be higher. Some are going to be lower. I'm okay, but I want to make sure that the big ones are. Um, are appropriate. So, so Berkshire has unrealized gains, very significant unrealized gains. If they were to sell those securities, they'd have to pay tax. Now, th- knowing Berkshire, there's certain tax advantages, um, certain ways that the tw- this twenty one percent rate would probably be effectively lower. Again. Mm-hmm. Keeping it simple, <clears throat> using the headline rate, we have to knock off thirty-four billion for this deferred tax liability. So, net, we can say that as a source of value, the equity portfolio is worth two hundred and seventy-two billion dollars. So, okay. right there, we have you know one hundred and five, eighteen. You know, we're we're pushing, um, you know, four hundred billion dollars worth of value right there just from those uh, readily, uh, again, sort of mark to market, if you will. Yeah, somewhat assets. liquid assets. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Wow, well, that's that's a huge part. I mean, that's kind of the lion's share of their current market cap. Right, and when you, when you really start to look at it that way, it, it, it becomes apparent, okay, may, maybe, Maybe it's 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 complex, but it really is not that complicated to come come up to a valuation. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as you're not, you know, being wildly optimistic, you know, saying, okay, well, I think Apple's worth ten trillion dollars or something crazy, or you know, whatever it might be, mm-hmm. um, you're you're going to be in the ballpark. <clears throat> so, and do you, no, um, quick question oh, with some of the the other bigger names? Do you? basically just focus on the top five stocks uh, of their equity holdings or even branch out to the top 10 sometimes if you feel like it's warranted? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly as uh, Berkshire's the largest holding in, in my portfolio, both personally and with clients and uh, clients uh, are invested the same way as, as I am. So um, 
and something I pay attention to, and I'm certainly interested in in what Berkshire owns and the changes that they're they're making. You know, fortunately, there's generally few, and a lot of the uh, the changes get a lot of the, a lot of press. But you know, just kind of keeping keeping an eye on on the names, and um, I mean, even just just from an education standpoint. Okay, Berkshire made this move. Mm-hmm. What can I learn from it? So. Um, I don't, again, I don't, I think you're, you're going to get this, you know, sort of 80, 20 rule and, you know, mm-hmm. literally, I mean, 75% of, of the portfolio is in, in five names. So yeah, uh, you, you really do have diminishing returns when it comes to that. Now, you know, Berkshire owns say a little bit of snowflake, which, uh, Todd Combs got them into. Uh, I, I don't really understand that business. I just kind of have to trust that they know what they're doing. I don't, I don't attempt to understand it. I don't try to value it. I don't make an adjustment for it. I think at that point you're kind of getting really into the, the fine. Um, you're starting to lose the bigger picture. I think. Mm. Okay. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're certainly again. You're 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 certainly not wrong to take the time to maybe do that or say hey i'm going to use up to the date you know uh prices for the, for the equity portfolio and say no geez you know it's gone down over the last quarter so i need to i need to change my my valuation adjustment mm-hmm. um, okay makes sense yeah So then we move on to the equity method investments. So these are investments where Berkshire doesn't, they don't own a small piece of it, like a marketable security. They don't own all of it, like a Geico or some some of those other wholly owned businesses. They Mm -hmm. own somewhere in between. The difference is with these equity method investments, they are accounted for as if they were wholly owned in the sense of they don't get marked to market every quarter. Uh So the best example here is Kraft Heinz uh, and now Occidental Petroleum. Mm -hmm. Berkshire owns 26% of Kraft Heinz. You can take the market value, and again, this is another adjustment that you can make. You could say, "Well, geez, Kraft Heinz shares are trading at X per share. Berkshire has, um, you know, this many shares. Okay, I'm just going to take that out and value it separately." You can do that. Um, I've just kept it simple and used what Berkshire presents as earnings. So, um, if if Kraft Heinz was held in, the, if, if they owned 15% of Kraft Heinz instead of 26%, it would be reported under investments and we would have it included uh, here. Okay. <clears throat> All that would show up on the income statement are the dividends. Mm-hmm. When it's an equity method investment, Berkshire reports in its earnings, its proportional share of Kraft Heinz's earnings. So, okay. um, again, round numbers, if Kraft Heinz earns a billion dollars and they only dividend out, you know, let's just use round numbers, 50%, they're going to send out, you know, uh, $500 million. Berkshire's going to have, you know, a quarter of that. They're going to show $100 million worth of dividends. Well, Berkshire actually owns 26% of that, those billion dollar of earnings. Berkshire here is going to show 260 million because that's their proportion, their their proportionate share of Kraft Heinz's earnings. Yeah, and that's um, inclusive of the dividends. Uh, nope. So it would be the gross number. So there's there's the earnings, and then dividends just gets they, they don't get reported anywhere. It just shows up in cash. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's still just two hundred. They they show the two hundred sixty million out of one billion. Yeah, but in 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 my example, the the actual numbers are are different. Yeah, might be different. Um, yeah. Okay. So, 
this this class of uh and i think i have this here so it's i think i just used the balance sheet number um Twenty eight seven fourteen. So I've just yeah. used that number. You can go in again, and I I use uh, trailing four quarters. But you know, they break these down. You can see what they own. American Express is now going to be included in that. Um, okay. You can see again the carrying value, what the fair value is based on the market value, just because these are publicly held. Um, and then you can see this equity and earnings. So um, why don't we just use we'll just use real numbers. So mm -hmm. in the third quarter of 2022, Berkshire's share of Kraft Heinz's earnings were $114 million. Okay. So, so Berkshire reports earnings in, under that equity method in income of 114 million if it only owned if it was just reported as dividends they, they'd actually report 131 million so that, it, that might be, not be a great example because it's higher um if we use the other category which includes things like um this little business called um electric transmission of texas it's a distribution line utility uh, business in Texas, um, Pilot Flying J, which they own, um, I think right now, 50% of. Um, they will buy up to 80% this year. But you can see, just using this other as an example, mm -hmm. earnings were 327 million, but they only received 94 million in cash. Okay. So um, if we're valuing this, we can i've used the balance sheet method i just say okay it's it's on the balance sheet for x i think that's an appro roughly appropriate value you could say i think the earning power of these businesses is y and then multiply that by 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 a multiple you you can go to that level mm -hmm. we're we're sort of just we're we're looking for value so you can either use the balance sheet value on the one hand or you could use a capitalized level of earnings which should roughly equal each other right you're just kind of coming at it at two different ways okay um, so so those are equity method investments <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, again relatively small small dollars but important to include definitely mm -hmm. a source of value for berkshire yeah so again those are sort of like the in-between investments that aren't aren't marketable securities but they're not wholly owned businesses and they they kind of fall in between but the accounting makes them reported differently yeah <laughs> then we get into the actual operating businesses and mm -hmm. They're, they're grouped into a couple of buckets, but the the first two, um, the, the first one, BNSF, is is the railroad, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, is its own business. So um, it's wholly owned by Berkshire. The way I look at this is, I've got a separate tab here. I do have all of the quarterly revenues expenses um car loadings you know so you, you start to look at the, the volume of units what's how, how these are trending um like for example consumer will probably be down uh hmm. this quarter um it's a stable business but it does change over time but that's that's what's driving uh the business is, mm -hmm. is car loadings then i look at just trailing uh, four quarters just to kind of get a sense of how the business is progressing over time. And you can see, you know, on an annualized basis, this business is earning $8 billion pre-tax and about uh, $6 billion after tax. <clears throat> um, it's a very good business. Mm 
mm-hmm. they uh, there's a couple of little quirks uh which I, I get into in the book and and even into the, the the newsletter where because the railroad and this shows up a little bit more in the utility business because the railroad is investing so aggressively what well, has it has been in the past it's kind of pulled back from this aggressive investment uh, approach but essentially they're they're paying less cash taxes than what the income statement would lead you to believe so oh. these net these net earnings are are very a very high quality and you can see that the the rail typically will dividend up to Berkshire Hathaway parent three and a half to four billion dollars a year mm-hmm. so um it's retaining some of those earnings for a future reinvestment which is how the earnings are growing over time <clears throat> But what I basically do for this is look at the trailing four quarters of after-tax earnings, <clears throat> come up with a valuation multiple, and then that gives me the implied value of BNSF. Okay. Now, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, sorry, I had a little bit of a connection drop there, but that... You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll edit that out. Um, so, uh, how how would you also know that this is like separated from, even though it's on the books of national indemnity, but they uh, like, I guess it seems like it's broken out, so you can count it separately, and it's not included in, say, investment income or something like that. Right, and th- and that's that's one of the things with the Berkshire Hathaway where. The accounting is just so good and informative, so it's it's not hard to see. And 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 BNSF is is unique in in one respect, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but they actually report in here uh, as a separate operating unit. When a when a unit has, I think the threshold is ten percent, ten percent of an entity's revenues, it has to be reported separately and broken out um so oops so you you can look it's right here they they break it out railroad um revenues expenses um that this is where the information will come from so it's it's all here in the report They, Mm -hmm. they they list it separately now i say bnsf is a little bit different because it has public debt you can actually go to the sec website and BNSF will report 10 Ks and 10 Qs of its own. Oh. So that's that's where I get the the dividend to the parent information. Mm. That doesn't show up anywhere on Berkshire's report here. Okay. You have to go to the SEC to get that information. Mm. Interesting information. It's not necessary to have from a valuation standpoint because we're just looking at its earnings, which you can get from the Berkshire report. Um, and again, you, you could look up uh, um, so Union Pacific operates basically as um, oh, an, an equal, slightly bigger, but e- equal competitor on the West mm-hmm. Coast of the United States. Um, so you can look up the market value of Union Pacific and say, okay, um, they should be roughly equal. So I think Union Pacific is probably worth, you know, 120 or 30 or 40 billion dollars. So why do I say it's worth 92? Well, I'm not a railroad expert. I am kind of just using a rough multiple here, but I also don't want to get too aggressive and so that's that's one of the mistakes i see some people make and say well geez union pacific is trading at 20 times earnings mm-hmm. therefore burlington northern santa fe should be worth 20 times earnings because geez if they spun it out it would be worth that right that that's mm-hmm. that logic right i my personal logic is if i'm going to own Ber- burlington northern santa fe via berkshire hathaway for 25 years or more I'm only going to get the cash that 
comes from this business. As an owner of Berkshire Hathaway, I have claim to this part of the $6.1 billion worth of earnings from BNSF. So a 15 times multiple roughly comes out to a 6.5% earnings yield, throw in a little bit of growth. Okay, now I'm earning 10% or so from this investment. If I say that it's worth 20 times earnings, you know, mm-hmm. and I can update this in, in the spreadsheet. All right, now it's worth, mm-hmm. again, $120 billion. Okay, that's fine. It's worth more. But what have you really changed? You've changed your expectations of future returns. You're saying, yeah. I'm okay with, you know, 20 times uh, earnings multiple equals a 5% yield. I'm okay with a 5% yield instead of a 6%, 6.5% yield. Mm-hmm. You just got to make sure you're you're not tricking yourself or, or confusing yourself to say, well, geez, it's worth this much. And, uh, you know, it, uh, the, I'm sort of on a tangent here, but the value of a bond, the yield of a bond changes based on its price and interest rates. So a yeah. $100 bond paying, um, uh, you know, $10 is a 10% yield. Well, if I say the value of that bond is two hundred dollars, I'm also saying I'm okay with a five a five percent yield, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you just be careful of what your valuation multiple implies. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the humility in me says maybe I don't know enough about the railroad business. Maybe I, maybe a higher multiple is appropriate, or there's something in Burlington Northern Santa Fe that I haven't appropriately accounted for. Um. I'm okay with that. I think I'd rather be conservative than push it. So I yeah. tend I tend not to to make these comparisons that say, well, the market says this. I really want to make sure that what I'm doing is based on the numbers that I'm seeing in my own thought process, mm-hmm. my own valuation methodology. I'm not outsourcing anyone anything to anyone. Right. Um, and, and also maybe the higher multiple was from more of the boom times of all the pent up pandemic demand of there were way more freight trains having to haul all that inventory. And now that we're kind of coming down from the all that demand of pent up supply that was backlogged, um, like maybe like I think I saw it in a Wall Street Journal article of some of the freight might be slowing down in the coming quarters because you know, people are spending less and maybe buying less stuff. So maybe that will also affect some of the freight rates of um, perhaps some of that, you know, might come back down. So even though Union Pacific had been enjoying a boom time higher multiple, maybe that's going to come back down to a more fair multiple at some point. That's right. Yeah, I just looked up. Uh, I just looked up Union Pacific. So it's 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 market value is one hundred and. 25 billion and it's trading at 18 times earnings um yeah and 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 i think even there and that that's where wall street kind of just goes you know you you just get too caught up in what next quarter next year is going to be going to look like and i i'd be hard pressed to say to to, for, for someone else to to tell me that you know bnsf's earnings power is anything materially different than $6 billion a year. Again, these sort of cash dynamics with the accounting and cash taxes could increase that a little bit, but roughly speaking, it's going to earn about $6 billion a year. Well, what's, what's that stream of cash worth? Mm -hmm. Um, And and again, understanding the business, there's two competitors on the West. The West coast of the United States is growing faster than the population as a whole. So you're going to have, uh, basically, you have this efficient means of transportation in a growing Western United States with an asset base that you cannot replicate. You cannot, you could not create another railroad. So you have yeah. this this earnings power that is utility-like, very consistent, and uh, defensible. Mm-hmm. So... Um, Again, some of these things, that, and you'll see revenues fluctuate over time as fuel prices change. Um, a couple of years ago, they had some issues with snow and on-time service and so forth. I mean, you want to understand these things, but um, 
you can get a lot just from sort of the headline figures. So that's that is uh, whoops, I'm clicking around here. Need the tab. That's BNSF. Mm -hmm. the energy business. So here's here's sort of an interesting uh, interesting one. So the energy business, Berkshire purchased first got into the energy business in the year 2000. Um, paid thirty five dollars and five cents a share for Mid American Energy. Iowa-based utility, that was sort of the base that they then used to acquire other utility assets. <clears throat> that business has not paid, contrary to, or, or um, in contrast to BNSF, the utility business has never paid a dividend to Berkshire Hathaway Parent. They've retained all earnings mm. since the year 2000. Its earnings power has gone up year by year because they invest in new projects and so forth. Um, so I'll just click to that tab here. I've kept it pretty simple in this spreadsheet, but I think it's important to know, and I'm just gonna slide around here. The utility business, I mean, the, these individual units would be Again, big companies on their own, but they're lumped mm -hmm. in with utilities on a very mm -hmm. high level. Yeah. Pacific Corp owns some utilities in the Western United States. Mid American is surprise, surprise, in the middle, middle, middle America. Mm -hmm. um, Iowa, Nebraska. Um, actually, I don't know if they're in Nebraska, um, South, uh, South Dakota, but primarily um, uh, Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, MV Energy, that's um, sort of southwestern uh, United States. Northern Power Grid is actually based in the UK. Oh, right. Yeah, I heard about that one. Um, natural gas pipelines. Berkshire has, I forget the number, like 9%, 9 or 10%. It might be more with their Dominion purchase. Uh, they, they, they move about 10% of all of the natural gas in the United mm. States. So this, this is just a pipeline business. Um, other energy businesses, they own things like a uh, transmission line in Alberta, Canada called AltaLink. Wow. Um, interestingly, just sort of a quirk of history, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, th that's what real estate brokerage is here. Mm -hmm. um, it just happened to be purchased by the energy business. Yeah. So, so that th there's a lot, there's a lot more in, in there. Like I said, I've kept it pretty high level here. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with BNSF, just looking at the trailing four quarters of earnings. Now, the, the quirk here, if you look down to the, the year, this trailing 12, uh, or even the, on a quarterly basis, you notice income tax expense is negative. Uh huh. Berkshire Hathaway Energy invests a ton in solar and wind in particular, and they get a ton of tax credits. <clears throat> Most utilities distribute most of their earnings to uh, to their investors, and they don't have a very large taxable base because Berkshire Hathaway owns Berkshire Hathaway Energy and pays a ton of income tax on its other businesses. It is able to fully take advantage of all of the tax benefits in its energy business. So this is another example where. The energy business would earn less if it were a, a part of Berkshire, if it were if it were split off. Mm -hmm. So this this source of earnings it it looks kind of strange, and typically you'd say, okay, well, I'm going to ignore a, a tax benefit because it's not repeatable. But in this case, it, the the after tax earnings power is actually higher than pre tax. Oh, um, yeah, it's kind of an odd odd dynamic but you can see over the last you know year or so um it's been consistently negative they've continued to find these projects um if they if something changes whether in the tax code or policy wise and, and this isn't going to happen anymore it could it could change the the earning power of the business but i've again just high level roughly speaking about three and a half uh, to, to $4 billion worth of, of earnings power. Um, where it gets a little bit interesting on this one, I've said the same thing. Okay, I've, I have this earnings power. 
what do I look for in terms of evaluation multiple? I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to use 15 times. I just think it's roughly, roughly right. Mm -hmm. Um, What's interesting is I come up with a valuation of about 55 billion round numbers. Warren Buffett thinks the business is worth closer to 90 billion. Ah. How do I, how do I know that? Well, um, earlier in the year, Greg Abel sold his 1% stake to Berkshire Hathaway. Greg mm -hmm. Abel uh, is sort of the, or is the heir apparent to Warren Buffett actually started in this business called Cal energy, mm -hmm. uh, which became mid American energy came up through the ranks. Uh, he's now vice chairman of non-insurance businesses. Um, and you know, sort of the, the CEO in waiting, um, anyways, Greg had a 1% ownership interest in the business. And when he sold that to, to Berkshire, the implied valuation was $90 billion. Right. Without, you know, you, you can, you can knock off a couple things off of that one again, sort of just a little quirk of Berkshire, the BYD shares that Berkshire owns are at, is actually held by Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Okay. So when Greg was paid, that's an asset that wouldn't have, it would have been a sort of an, an extra asset that would have had to have been accounted for. At the time, well, I don't know what that would have been worth, roughly $5 billion. Um, I could be wrong on that. But um, so, so you have that asset and maybe you have some cash. So it, it, it probably from, from comparing apples to apples, maybe it wasn't 90 billion, but it's higher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's higher than this 55 billion. I'm okay with that. I don't, you know, okay, well, geez, Warren Buffett thinks it's worth this. Well, I don't have to use his number. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm looking at it from how much cash is going to be sent to me as an owner. If I owned all of this business, what kind of valuation, what kind of earnings yield would I want? Um, that's where I come up with the 15. I think it's consistent and I think it works with the business. So all told yeah. about 50, $55 billion. And maybe, maybe that like 90 billion was sort of more one time, like kind of as a, a premium to show, you know, how much we value your contribution to the company, Greg Abel. And, you know, we're, we're giving you the, the higher end of the overall valuation that it could potentially be, but the more conservative average um, income earning ability is, you know, closer to what you've calculated out over several quarters and years. Yeah, I, I, I suspect, well, I, I know Warren Buffett knows more about the business than I do, but uh, I, I suspect Warren would not pay any kind of premium to, to Greg. It would be, you know, he, he would he would feel that he was giving, if, if he paid more than what the intrinsic value of the business was, that it would be hurting Berkshire's other shareholders and, and, and he wouldn't do that. So um, again, I think if you knock off that, you know, the BYD, um, shares and maybe some cash that maybe you get down to 80 billion or something so so maybe it's not that far off um mm -hmm. but in any event that's that's the energy business very good business for berkshire mm -hmm. um, again retains its earnings has the ability to take lots of capital so if a project came up or, or another acquisition uh, materialized and greg said i want to spend 10 billion dollars buying you know some asset they could do it. They could yeah. literally, literally move the capital overnight from other parts of Berkshire. Right. And, so and actually, that reminds me, what about, um, say, there's some value attributed to research and development projects at Berkshire Energy that may not be as reflective on the books. So maybe that adds an element of additional value that is not as accounted for yet. Yeah, it could be. Um, they've played around with uh, they have some geothermal wells and they've played around with zinc recovery over time that hasn't really panned out and they they do some things um yeah I, again warren buffett's going to know more about the business than i am so there's there's probably some things in there that um that that i don't know about or don't fully appreciate so um 
So the next the next segment is manufacturing, service, and retailing, and mm -hmm. this is a huge, uh, hugely diversified list of businesses uh, under Berkshire, and everything from a uh, Acme Brick to jewelry businesses, mm -hmm. Dairy Queen, yeah, um, Marmon Precision Cast Parts is under there. Justin Boots. Um, yeah, Brooks, Justin Boots. Fruit, of, Fruit the loom. of the Loom. Yeah. Um, McLean, uh, the, the food distributor. How about Lots. NetJets? NetJets is under there. Yep. Pretty uh, much everything else is Seas Candy would be under there. And mm -hmm. and again, I, 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 I want to make sure that everyone really appreciates. So we'll just go to that tab now. It's broken out now into uh, manufacturing businesses, and, and those are broken down into industrial buildings, products, and consumer products. Then the service businesses, retailing businesses, and then McLean is its own standalone entity just because of the, the level of revenues that it generates. Tiny amount of profits, but revenues are just huge mm -hmm. uh, because of the way the business is. <clears throat> but even within you know, industrial products includes um, uh, IMC, which is an uh, Israeli uh, company that makes carbide cutting tools. There's Marmon, makes a lot of industrial products, cranes, um, tank cars for rails, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Buildings, pr building products, uh, Shaw Carpet is under there, Benjamin Moore Paint. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Th those those kind of businesses, uh, Clayton Homes, and then the consumer products are the, the things like the jewelers and the the retailers and and so forth. Um, service businesses is where um, NetJets would show up, and then retailing. You know, some of the home. Uh, actually, the, the retailers would be the the jewelry businesses. The the consumer products would be things like Duracell, um, and uh, does building products have Clayton Homes or some of the home-based stuff? Yep. So, so, and and even even with this list, oops, I keep bringing this up. Even with this list here, it doesn't fully reflect what's in there. I mean, I have. Uh, let's see if I can have it. I think I have a list here in this report of yeah. So, I mean, you just look at this list. Um, Do you mind zooming in a little bit? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Some of the some of the businesses that are under this broad umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um there's a lot of them here. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just want to go so if you look in the in the report, um you know, here's here's where they show up on a quarterly basis, but you can see, you know, they'll go through the manufacturing businesses, you know, the industrial ones, like I said, precision cast parts, Lubrizol, um, go through, and it's pretty high level. I mean, that's one of the, I guess you'd say negatives of, of Berkshire is, you know, like precision cast parts was a fortune 500 company it comes, mm -hmm. becomes part of Berkshire, you know, and it goes from having its own hundred page annual report to, you know, a couple of paragraphs. So you do lose uh -huh. something when it comes to, to Berkshire. Um, yeah, building products that includes Clayton Homes. Um, mm -hmm. So even within these sort of seemingly, you know, six six categories, sort of a lot of categories, there's a lot that still goes on underneath them. Now you don't have to understand the dynamics of every business. You don't have to understand. Um, you just need to roughly, you have to know what's what's, in them what's in each category and roughly kind of how they the attributes of the businesses right the retailers they're going to get hurt um or the consumer businesses are going to get hurt if you know we go into a recession or so forth mm -hmm. uh, home builders are still you know hitting it out of the park because of uh housing shortages mm -hmm. uh, these are businesses that earn great returns on capital over time but you know the, the uh, the brick business is another another good example. When we go through a recession or if home building slows down, 
they're going to they're going to slow down maybe they'll have to idle some plants but it's a business that has defensible a defensible moat around it because mm -hmm. bricks are very heavy it's a very low cost to weight type of product and you can only ship it so far from a plant mm -hmm. that business is going to be it's simple and it's going to be around forever so yeah. um, they will fluctuate over time and you want to know what's happening with the business but from a, a valuation standpoint you're really okay just looking at this earnings power mm -hmm. seeing and knowing what what comes under them and looking at the the profitability of of all of these um so here again a, a wide collection of businesses rough earnings power of about 12 billion dollars a year i'm consistent in using that 15 times multiple it's your roughly to 185 billion dollars of um of value mm -hmm. and how much if at all does the your implied multiple of pre-tax earnings factor into anything well so i i i actually upped my multiple when taxes went down to 21 percent. i i had used a, a 12 12 times multiple um <clears throat> just upped it with the with the tax um so again it, it kind of comes down to what what you're looking for out of an investment um you know you, you if again if 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 my expectations from an investment is 10 percent a year and your expectations are five percent you can pay more for that business because you're accepting a lower return mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it really just kind of comes down to what your expectations are um, i mean even you know chris bloomstrand who would argue knows even more about Berkshire Hathaway than I do. He's been looking at it for a lot longer and writes an incredible annual letter mm -hmm. on Berkshire. I think he uses a higher valuation multiple. Um, and, and I'm okay with that. I mean, I, I don't, I, that's where I think you, you don't have to be right. Um, you just have to be roughly right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think Chris, I could be wrong. But I think he used maybe 18 times for, for the manufacturing service and retailing business, um, which again, you're not wrong with you look at those businesses they're very good businesses uh, they have good returns on capital growth prospects and so forth could you be justified in doing that absolutely um i just do that again keeping it consistent and because i want to be conservative mm -hmm. right <clears throat> so that gets us to um to sort of almost all the way there the last piece mm -hmm. is insurance underwriting now in the two column method you look at operating earnings per share and investments per share and, and, and just like we did here we're, we're saying okay the the uh bonds the cash and the equity securities are worth what they're worth the way those are funded is through the insurance operation and so we can't value the insurers as a standalone with the balance sheet approach because we've already accounted for the the assets over here mm -hmm. up top. okay um most insurance companies don't make consistent profits over time insurance at berkshire has consistently been over time profitable and so the way I arrive at the valuation for insurance underwriting, again, this is just the underwriting portion, is to assume a, an underwriting margin on the premiums that they earn. So Berkshire, right, right now, um, setting aside the fact that they just bought Allegheny, which will increase their premiums, um, roughly brings in $70 billion worth of premiums per year. I think over time that they will earn a four tax four percent pre-tax margin which means that they're writing to a combined ratio of 96 percent they're paying out in expenses and losses less than they're taking in they should earn roughly three billion dollars per year um, i've only capitalized this at 12 times just to be mm -hmm. even more conservative and i come up with a value of of 34 billion um it has to happen over time and you know it's it's 
if you look at the last quarter, they actually lost money on underwriting, but I'm, ass I'm assuming a normalized earnings power. And if you look back on Berkshire's history, they've been successful in, in earning, uh, earning a, uh, an underwriting profit. So right. the, ins the insurance business within Berkshire is incredibly valuable. And it has, you know, $150 billion worth of float which is free money that Berkshire gets to invest and float over time, if that is perpetual, will show up in value uh, in, in earnings and then having those assets uh, on the investment side that they're able to to maintain and, and increase in value. And so, why did you give it a more conservative 12 in the valuation multiple? Again, compared just to the others that are 15. Yeah, just just sort of the uncertainty, I, th I think, in, in my mind, just no you know the, these are businesses with consistent earnings power maybe they have some growth uh the insurance underwriting it might grow organically over time but I, I, there's no sort of direct growth factor if you will um mm. and again just to be conservative um and sort of give myself a little bit of a little bit of room um come up with that number Mm -hmm. And the the hundred fifty billion dollars in float does that include, um, say, you know, some of these premiums that are indicated, or where where do you figure the hundred fifty billion of float again? Yeah. So, and, and we can actually, I think it might even be higher. So I'll just go. Berkshire when they put out their quarterly earnings reports, actually. And you can you can do this value, you know, you can get most of these sort of high level numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. well, if you're a subscriber, you know, shameless plug, you get my yeah. worksheet for for nothing. I do all the work for you. But um, they they put out in the earnings release these these big categories, including operating earnings, which is the number that you want to you focus on. Um, oh, it was 150 billion. So so right in here, they tell us what float was at the end of okay. the quarter. So it was 150 billion, an increase of three billion since year end 2021. So uh, Berkshire, so float is sort of this nebulous concept that's not fully understood. So if you, using auto insurance as an example, you pay your auto policy, say it's a thousand bucks a year, <clears throat> you pay that up front. Well, hopefully you're using Geico. Mm -hmm. Geico will take that money and gets to, they get to hold on to it until they either pay out claims or or earn money uh, or or earn that. So you forked over a thousand dollars for or let's use twelve hundred dollars because make make it make it the, the numbers easy. You 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 pay twelve hundred dollars January first to Geico. They only earn from an accounting standpoint a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. They have use of that cash to then invest. So mm -hmm. that's the float. Now it shows up in losses too, and it's a little bit counterintuitive uh, at first. But if if you pay Geico your premium, you're covered. You get into an auto accident, and they owe you ten thousand dollars to to fix your car. If they haven't paid you that yet, it's money that they owe. It's still sitting in their bank account. They get to make money off of that, so mm -hmm. it's a combination of premiums. Um, so let's say it includes a little bit of that seventy billion, like revenue in the quarter. Yep, and so I'll just I'll just pull up the uh, so the balance sheet. It's it's a liability, and again, this is where it becomes a little bit counterintuitive. You mm -hmm. can you can roughly get to the float number by adding up unpaid losses. Okay. Um, for regular contracts, Berkshire, and I won't get into retroactive reinsurance, but it's just another form of insurance, some other losses that they have. Mm -hmm. um, those are losses. That's money that they have not yet paid out, but will pay out over time. And the key there is over time because some of these liabilities actually stretch out over decades. Mm -hmm. Unearned premiums is that January 1st, fork over the 1200 bucks. They haven't earned that. Now, February 1st, they're going to earn $100. Mm -hmm. 
because they've covered you for that month, even if you don't get into an accident. If you cancel, they'd have to pay back eleven hundred because they haven't earned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's what that number is. Um, life and, and annuity benefits; those are another just uh, liability that they have, and then this other policyholder liability. So that's money that they have or owe but have not paid out. Now, when you're calculating float on the flip side, there are these things, deferred charges, um, and then there's some other assets that are on the books where Berkshire is owed but haven't been paid, so you have to net those out. Uh, but that's that's roughly where it will show up on the balance sheet uh, from a high so, level. So among all these, what do you add and subtract from So float, I, I, again, you kind of have to use Berkshire's number because the things are are, are lumped in. There's a, there's a number of things like, um, for example, uh, deferred policy acquisition costs, um, DPAC, with an auto insurer. If Geico advertises, they have to spread those advertisements out over the life of you know when when they think that customer will. Um, the life of that customer mm -hmm. so um and i don't fully understand exactly the, the length of that but but there there are things that where they've laid out money that don't show up and then they're on the flip side there's money that has been given to them that hasn't gone through so if we just take um you know 91 642 plus 36 6 28 78 plus 22 305 You get 186 billion, and then if you subtract 10 billion, you get to 176. There are other things in mm -hmm. there. Um, that's just that was just a rough. <laughs> it was just a very rough uh, calculation of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so there's probably something else that they, you know, are uh, whatever they have to reserve, right? Whatever you know, they're sort of. I know they always say we'll always have 30 billion uh set aside you know of of having to cover what was it like their loss reserves yeah that that's that's an internal number where they say we're, we're not going to go below 30 billion in cash um there are and i'm going to try to find this here okay so <clears throat> this is getting into the weeds but unpaid losses and loss adjustment expenses Mm -hmm. So net Berkshire at the, at the beginning of 2022 owed its, its claimants net of reinsurance that it, it basically insurance money that it owes that other insurance companies are liable for. We'll just ignore that for a second. Um, mm -hmm. but they, they owe $84 billion. Mm -hmm. They, they incur losses every year currently roughly um the tune of 45 billion dollars per year now prior accident years and this is where knowing the insurance business and understanding how they account for things and how they are conservative in their numbers is very important this prior accident years is actually a negative number because they've overestimated their expenses in prior years they're conservative mm -hmm. they say we we think we're going to lose x we're going to pay out over you know you get into an accident or someone gets into an accident and they paralyze someone and as the insurer berkshire is now liable to pay that person x number of dollars or potentially x number of dollars over 20 years mm -hmm. so they're going to estimate how much they owe and they do it conservatively when the future actually materializes Typically, Berkshire's experience has been that they pay out less than they estimate. So they think that they're going to earn less than they actually do, which sort of most insurance companies or many of them will get aggressive in their accounting, try to show more earnings just to for whatever reason. Um, Berkshire actually is very conservative. Um, so they're they're basically uh, sort of under promising on what they're earning and kind of over delivering. That's right. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. And things can happen over time. I mean, um, uh, so so the, so you have the, the current current accident year that's 40 44 billion and then the prior year is um current accident year you know things like auto short tail policies where they're paying out very quickly those get paid out there's really not much estimating happening it's really when it comes down to workers comp um some of the retroactive reinsurance liabilities where this factors in um so that's the incurred losses and then down here is the paid losses and so you can see um they've paid out through the the, the first nine months of 2022 36 billion dollars worth of of money so berkshire is this huge i kind of like to think of it as a river or stream with a lake in the middle like mm. And then and then another stream going out so you have lots coming in lots of mm -hmm. cash coming in the door this pool of of water or or cash you know which is the float kind of sitting there in the middle and then money coming out and mm -hmm. so the the ins and the outs are going to change a little bit over time but because it's constantly churning they get that lake in the middle and that's the float they get uh -huh. to use that do whatever they want with it um and I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but the, but this 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 table over time is is very important to to show, um, to show their their um, the quality of their their underwriting and their reserving, and you yeah, can it, yeah no I have to just say it's a component of their float that 150 billion dollar figure right. Yes. Yep. So, so the money coming in, those premiums that come in, and then sort of again counterintuitively, a loss that hasn't been paid is float. And so that's mm -hmm. why you you have to really look at underwriting profitability and float, because you could increase your float by making a loss, but if your float went up by one billion dollars and you had a one billion dollar underwriting loss, well, those kind of cancel each other out, right? Um, uh, and I'm trying to find something here as we're, we're talking, um, there's something called a loss development table and I'm getting way into the weeds here and we can, you can stop me if you want. Um, well, I mean, it's very fascinating because I, I had never fully appreciated this. So I'm very grateful you're going through it. Yeah. And again, you know, you don't have to consider yourself, um, let's see if I can find, actually it might be in the. Oh, here we go. All right. Uh, professional liability, auto liability. Okay, we'll use auto as an example. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Okay. So... I want to make sure I'm explaining this appropriately. So in the year 2017, I don't know if this is just, okay, this is just Geico. <clears throat> Geico incurred losses of $14 billion. So they said all these insured got into however many accidents, add up all the damage, we think we have to pay 14 billion 95 million dollars mm -hmm. fast forward to and and so I'll, I'll just pause there for a second you look down here they paid out 5.8 billion for those accidents that happened in 2017. Mm -hmm. let's move forward one year forget about accidents that happened in 2018 only looking at accidents in 2017. Now they have more information at hand. More mm -hmm. of these accidents have been assessed, have gone to the repair shop. We have actual bills now. We're more confident in our estimates of 2017 losses. 13864000000 million. It's gone down. Mm -hmm. So they, they ended up paying out less than they thought they would need to. Their estimate of what they will pay out forever 
on uh -huh. on all accidents that happened in 2017 went down okay they paid out more right because they're they're actually going through the book somebody got into an accident you know in december um not going to be paid out until the the next year maybe so that's going to keep going up the the right the incurred loss and how much is paid will converge over time mm -hmm. once right. once you know exactly how much is going to pay out now let's look at again just accidents that happened in 2017 <clears throat> in the year 2019 it actually went up slightly 13 billion 888 mm -hmm. so again down from their initial estimate but up a little bit mm -hmm. so these changes so so year one 2017 when berkshire reported its earnings it would report it knows how many how much premiums it got and then it's going to say we're going to estimate these losses at 14 billion 095 fast forward to 2018 those those accidents have already those those expenses have already gone through the books mm -hmm. the way that they get accounted for is by that adjustment that we just looked at at that other table the the prior year accident right we're in 2018 prior year was 2017 the prior year estimate went down mm -hmm. that gets reported basically as a negative expense it's washed okay. and everything else but it's a negative expense now let's mm -hmm. look at 2019 again still 2017 accident year <clears throat> we're just mm -hmm. two years we're two years um from when those happened it actually went up slightly mm -hmm. that would then throw th flow through the income statement as an additional expense so all the expenses mm -hmm. from from 2019 and then they're going to add a little bit for the difference between what they thought it was worth or what they thought they were going to pay out in 2018 mm -hmm. and, and you just you walk that forward over year over years now auto is a short tail product your car you know how much your your car is going to be it's going to cost to fix your car in relatively short order mm -hmm. um, so you can see these numbers they're not going to change much and they're going to be pretty close so by 2021 five years have gone by mm -hmm. it's down from the initial estimate but it's still pretty close um this IBNR stands for incurred but not reported. Uh, basically, you know, okay, you got into an accident, you haven't told me yet. Um, we still need to account for some of that because we know that they will come up over time and kind of mm -hmm. ignore that. But you can see that at the end of five years, those accidents, they still think they've paid out 13 billion, 260 million. They've run through the income statement a total of 13 billion, 777. So there's still a half half billion dollars worth of claims still out there that uh, that haven't been paid yet, and those typically will be the longer term payouts. You've crippled someone; they have to pay them. You know that that kind of thing. But in the meantime, that shows up as a negative number in that other column we saw. Because uh, well, that 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 five hundred billion would be factored in, kind of in the parentheses. So, uh, so that would be your float. So, so they've they've said we lost thirteen point eight rough numbers, uh, but they've only paid out thirteen point three. So that mm -hmm. half five hundred million dollars would be sitting there in some sort of asset, um, but it would it would be it would be a liability that they haven't paid out yet. Now that's only five years because it's short term. Uh, medical professional liability they show 10 years and so this goes back to 2012 and you can see how these have developed your initial estimate was 1 1 billion 336 by 2021 they think it's only going to be 971 million and so you look these are called lost development tables and so you can see the trend tends to be that they over reserve mm -hmm. and then end up actually in incurring less of a charge it doesn't have mm -hmm. to go that way they they could go could go backwards um but you can see with some of these medical for example you know they probably got premiums here you know say, say they got premiums of a billion dollars or a billion three they pay them out very slowly mm -hmm. right so that's the long tail that's why this float sticks around for a while you kind of have this churning that's happening with some of the short tail stuff they're paying stuff out but a lot of these liabilities stick around for a long time 
Now that's a good thing in the standpoint from the standpoint of float, but it also means there's a risk that you haven't appropriately assessed the risks. So wow, that's great. Let's let's do more of this business. Then you find out five years from now, oops, these are actually more expensive policies than we expected. Uh oh, you can't change mm -hmm. the past. You're stuck mm -hmm. paying out. Um, again, sidebar, interesting fact. Berkshire once received, I think the number is like ninety-two thousand, ninety-two thousand dollars in premiums for a risk that ultimately costed a couple hundred million dollars in loss. Wow. They had to pay it. They just had That's to incredible. Wow. So long tail insurance can be very good. Berkshire has managed it very well. Some of the best businesses, insurance businesses in the world. But that especially post Buffett and you know looking out 10 or 20 years, those are the things you're going to want to be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Are they changing the nature of the insurance and are they doing, are, are, are these developing differently because they're changing the model? Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's too late. Again, go through these workers comp, same sort of um, uh, trends that you'll see and you, you don't have to go through these. This is an interesting table uh, that just, just to kind of show you <clears throat> mm -hmm. physical damage for Geico, 97% of what they think that they lost is paid out the first year. And, th and that makes sense, right? Get into an mm -hmm. accident, they know how much it's going to cost to pay mm -hmm. it out, done. Um, yeah. Auto liability, again, might trail out a little bit, but it's pretty short tail. Professional liability, just 2% the first year, 8%. Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time for these to pay out. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by uh long tail and then you get into retroactive that's when berkshire insures other insurance companies for losses that they have incurred in the past but they want to mm -hmm. have a known number it just um we don't have to get into that but that's yeah uh, that's some of some of berkshire's uh insurance businesses all right cool um, wow well that was very fascinating i appreciate that you went through all that yeah and again i can i can go deep uh you know and if certainly if your listeners or watchers have any questions we can we can geek out on this stuff um so well, and, and that's why folks should check out your newsletter and we'll i'll ask you to show where people can sign up and we'll also include that in the links below but also your book your amazing history of berkshire hathaway book and like you know there's way more value to derive from a lot of what you've published so i you know I'm, this is a flavor of of a lot of the great things you put out there. So I'm I'm just so grateful that you've gone through, walked through this. I know it's been um, a, maybe a little bit of a longer session that um, like a lot of videos might might not last as long as this, but it's, I think, really important, valuable information that you might not get anywhere else. So I think for all of those people who still stuck with watching through now, I hope that you feel like it's been worth it because this has been incredibly fascinating and enlightening to me. So I, I'm i sure that people who are true Berkshire loyalists will greatly appreciate what you've schooled us on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to be able to explain it. And often the financial press uh, doesn't get it right or they just report the headline numbers or uh, to, to really appreciate what berkshire is uh you know i think the, the more people that appreciate it the better and so just to kind of wrap up and and finish mm -hmm. this off here <clears throat> at at the parent company level berkshire has some debt that it's appropriate to subtract so that's where this 19.2 billion comes from as, as a negative it's not it's not showing up anywhere um i'm not deducting anything for say the debt that bnsf has the debt that uh, some of these other businesses have most of it's uh, in the utility and the rail um, we're just saying we're we're implicitly saying that the balance sheets of those entities are appropriately financed they're not juiced by debt um, we're okay using the earnings power from those businesses uh, but at, at the holding company level if berkshire if berkshire borrows money to buy a business it's appropriate to to subtract that out, and it's a relatively small number. So, and is this long term debt? 
that's just all debt. Um, and again, if you just go to the um, uh, to the the filings, there's a parent company balance sheet here. Parent company, and so it, it looks kind of funny because you have investments in subsidiaries, four hundred eighty six billion. Um, most assets like all uh, most of the equity securities are actually held by the insurance company again managed for their own benefit but because they're in an insurance company I mean, berkshire is the most well capitalized insurer in the entire world because they write just a fraction of premiums typically it's you know how much how much an equity capital do you have and you can write you know a multiple of that so like an auto insurer Geico, you know, might write $30 billion worth of premiums per year, uh, but it might only need $10 billion worth of capital. Um, Berkshire writes, you know, $70 billion a year, and they have something like $300 billion worth of capital in, in the insurance businesses. So um, anyways, that, that's sort of a, uh, an aside, but this is the parent company balance sheet. And so you mm -hmm. can see here um, this, this number, notes payable and other borrowings. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 all all of all of that debt. Um, and did you adjust a little bit down for something, or was that from a, the quarter figure? You know what? Um, oh, I, I this is the year. This is the annual. Yeah, that's the annual yeah, okay. one. So probably the quarter one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This this quarterly one would show the nineteen. Okay. Yeah, they, so they, it's just that notes payable one. It's like their corporate debt, right? There is it in the form of corporate bonds or. Um, so a lot of that is um, Berkshire, yeah, nineteen point two billion. So Berkshire mm -hmm. borrowed uh, in yen. So you saw that, oh. you know, or, or some euro, uh, euro, uh, euro denominated debt at some very low interest rates, and so that was done. You know, see, nineteen point two billion. Um, some of that is, uh, let's see, yeah, so. 1.1 billion dollars in yen with maturities from 27 to 52 at a weighted average interest rate of half a percent mm. so they they made capital allocation decisions at the parent company level that will ultimately add value but i mean it's it, it is real debt that does does need to be subtracted but yeah that, that's why that looks a little bit different mm -hmm. um so you add okay. all of those all of those asset and capitalized values up and you get seven hundred and seventy-two billion dollars mm -hmm. um, for the enterprise, right? And that's how I always look at it. You start with the company level, no matter what what company I'm looking at. Then you look at how many shares they have outstanding, and that will give you a value per share. So again, round numbers: three hundred and fifty-one dollars per Class B share, um, which equates to to one point six seven percent, or one point six times book value. Um, and as of today, again, this is a live spreadsheet that subscribers have access to. Berkshire was was trading at three hundred eight dollars, so you know it's slightly twelve percent discount uh, to intrinsic value. So, um, wow, still, still, um, still a good buy on on that basis. But like, um, what what might be, I guess, especially on sale i suppose like some of the opportunities to have bought berkshire at a deep discount to its intrinsic value might have been in that march 2020 drop and i think in the fall when it might have touched i want to say briefly around the 260 range per share in the berkshire b shares so back then that might have been uh more of a discount i would imagine to its intrinsic value yeah and here so in in this report uh this the the newsletter i do have a quarter end price to book value uh chart it goes all the way back to, to 1965 and, and just sort of very broadly the the business was under book value at the very beginning and was probably worth that as the business matured and got better and better the price to book increased and again once it once it got to this sort of mid uh mid 90s it was it was overvalued but then you can kind of see it settle out into this you know between one and one and a half times book value 
Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, th those times certainly uh, March of of 2020 when it traded at at book value, you know, you you probably couldn't go wrong. But then then you face the the you're facing the same problem that Buffett has in buying back shares. Do you buy Berkshire undervalued or are you going to buy some other company that might also have gotten beat up? So it's not, you still have that opportunity cost question of, mm -hmm. all right, well, if everything's on sale, <laughs> um, then it might not be as, as, as obvious. Um, but certainly knowing, oh, yeah. certainly knowing the quality of Berkshire Hathaway, you would not do wrong to become a long-term owner in Berkshire when it got beaten up. Yeah. Well, and in retrospect, I mean, Berkshire was doing a lot of buybacks in 2020 and 2021. So I think given some of the options at the time, um, he, he also thought it was a great deal to do a bunch of buybacks. And, and maybe now as the, some market values are coming down for some equities, Maybe it's not as appealing to do as much buybacks as it once was a couple of years ago. And now there's other things going more on sale that they're pouncing on. So, yeah, I, I can see that some of that ca capital allocation decision making play out in some of the top 10 holdings they seem to be adding to their equity portfolio. Yeah, that's that's the constant. Uh, and, and Berkshire can do a lot of a lot of both. Um, I mean, they they really have. A cash gusher. I mean, probably over thirty billion dollars a year coming in to to work with. So, um, just going through the newsletter, kind of just to just to highlight a couple of things. This aggregate uh, adverse loss development, this negative number, that's the, the favorable underwriting. And you can see, you know, going back in each each of the last ten years, it was it was favorable. So. Um, just to show the, the level of conservatism that Berkshire has in insurance float float information over time, how that has developed uh, cash as a percentage of total assets. Cash has gone way up over the last few years and people have mm -hmm. criticized Buffett, but as a percentage of total assets, it's actually stayed fairly, fairly flat. Um, so just looking at these things in, in context is important. Um, shares outstanding. You kind of have this, um, in late, uh, well, it was 1998, they bought Genry with with shares. 2010, they, they bought uh, BNSF in part with shares. And now they're just in this capital return phase. I mean, look at this, the shares outstanding are going down. So you, you have mm -hmm. this, you have this coiling spring, uh, spring, if you will, where, you know, Berkshire's just getting more and more valuable and, um, you know, it may not always be the best investment out there in terms of upside potential, but in terms of quality and diversity and um, taking the time to understand it uh, really will, will do you well. And you learn a lot from it, too. I mean, that's sort of the, the other thing with it. It's the gift that keeps on giving because you, you learn more about investing as you learn about your investment. And so. Um, well, yeah. And it also uh, seems like no matter what the economic conditions have been like, they seem to consistently deliver above average rates of return on investment. So, you know, even I feel like it's still kind of um, hitting at close to the 20% return on average, which is sometimes pretty amazing. I mean, it's not, I know it's not always that in, in terms of say their stock market value, but they got at an overall aggregate for them to be able to still put up numbers that are pretty high, um, I think is, probably surprisingly rewarding to a lot of investors who, you know, they might think this is a sleepy conglomerate, but really it's, it's, uh, I guess, to mix some analogies, it seems to be also punching above its weight for maybe what, you know, like people might not fully appreciate Berkshire and they might think that Warren and Charlie are getting a little old with Warren going on 93 this year and Charlie being 99 now. And they think like, you know, how much more can these guys keep going? But like they, they still deliver incredibly, all things considered, of of like it's still amazing what they've developed in terms of the company culture. And um, even when someday when we no longer have Warren and Charlie around, I think that they'll still be able to perform pretty ex excellently in, in what they've built. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's just amazing. Yeah. And again, I think going forward, 
you know, I, I, I would feel confident saying Berkshire, you know, can, can earn 10% a year. Um, it's just, it's hard when it's so, it's so large, but you know, when you look at, and just to kind of, um, a, a, a reason for looking at this gap adjusted financials is mm -hmm. you get to a, a, an economic earning power. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, $48 billion is roughly what Berkshire can earn. Well, you know, if, if you're paying six hundred million dollars for that, I mean, you're, you're going to do pretty well over time. I mean, knowing the quality of the businesses that that it has. Um, so, I think you know it's risk adjusted. However, you want to define that, it's it's one of the best investments out there. It's not gonna it's not gonna deliver you you know crazy crazy returns like it has in the past, but certainly as a as a base of the portfolio and, and to buy when. When Mr. Market goes crazy and puts it on sale, you know, you, you can really do well over time. So, um, yeah, especially if people want something more reliable that you can depend on that, that within, within reason, like you're not going to see some of the sheer amounts of volatility you might see with some other things out there, um, yeah. which, you know, some people are less comfortable with volatility, but if, if people, you know, don't have very strong stomachs that like, for the most part, I think Berkshire is not going to be churned out in in uh, ex too extreme levels of volatility. Well, it's it's really just um, I mean it's such a win win because when when the stock is way down, they buy back stock, and mm -hmm. you you know what you own, and it, it, it there's um, I, I'm a fan of the even though Berkshire doesn't pay a, a, a dividend, uh, you you can. You can do what what Buffett is. I don't know if Buffett called it this, or or I came up with this term of of manufacturing your own dividend, where you mm -hmm. essentially, I think he called it a sell off policy. And Buffett has essentially this running experiment going because in 2006 he donated or pledged shares to charity, and every year he gives away, I think it's four and a half percent of his shares. Well, his shares have gone down, I think, by half. But the value has actually doubled. Hmm. His, his holdings have actually doubled. So you could you can actually buy Berkshire and and say, okay, I'm going to sell off five percent every year, and it might feel weird selling um, selling five percent of your shares every year, but the value will continue to accrue. So you can kind of manufacture your own dividend by selling off using the sell off policy. And some years you're going to sell more, some years you would sell yet sell less, but it really just highlights the fact that you can only do as well as the underlying business does. And so over time that will show up in the market value of the company and, you know, just dollar for dollar, what Berkshire owns, the high, high quality of, of the businesses. And, you know, you and I have gone out to Omaha. Mm -hmm. uh, you've, you've seen that firsthand talking to some of the managers, just the, the quality of individuals and the culture there. It's, um, it's really something special. So I, I hope uh, I hope more people appreciate Berkshire. And again, if you're listening this far, yes, send send me an email. Let's 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 chat. Happy to answer any questions. And, and I'll, um, I'll include it in the description. But um, I don't know if you wanted to uh, vocally say your email or show it, or also where can folks sign up to your newsletter? Yeah. So watchlistinvesting.com. Uh, I do Why have. Why don't you pull it up? Oh yeah, I, I guess I can do that. So I have uh, this. This is the paid paid service, a deep dive. Generally, every month, I look at uh, a, a new business. I've covered all kinds of different businesses, including Berkshire, uh, Copart, Sherwin Williams. You know, some of these smaller companies too, like uh, Creighton's is a little UK based. Uh, business you can buy each issue if you want or or subscribe for two forty nine a year which is um i think uh, i tried to deliver a lot of a lot of value i've tried to, to invert the margin of safety principle and and give a lot more in value that i i charge for so i, I think it's a great value um so i i also write a free sub stack from time to time which you can sign up uh right on the home page here uh right here and uh, i'm on twitter at b r k underscore student um yeah on linkedin uh that's that's generally where to find me i, th I think twitter has been uh been pretty good but um 
yeah, happy to answer any questions on Berkshire. I should also mention uh, the Oracle's classroom. Oops. Yeah, that's your YouTube. Uh, well, it's both your YouTube channel name as well as your website. Yeah, so I've, I this is sort of the companion website to uh, the book where um, I've I've compiled. I had a I had a blog on here, but I made that the I made Substack. Uh, but I have a, a a long history of Berkshire. You know, going back to the eighteen hundreds. You know, you can you can scroll through and see some of the businesses that they owned uh, and and when they purchased them. And then another nice thing that I've done here is put archives. So you can go in and you can find most of the research material that I use to write the book. You know, some really cool old annual reports and, and 10Ks and um, virtual predecessor companies going back to the 1800s. I mean, it just there's so much rich material and, and kind of just following in Buffett's footsteps. Uh, I said, I, I should just share this with the world. Um, I have some right. book, book recommendations there. You can also find, uh, I have a 200 tab Excel file uh, wow. that I use to create the book. Um, if you really want to geek out on, oops, don't worry, I don't, it's, it's not suspicious. I don't know why this <laughs> thing blocks it. Um, I don't know if I can pull it up. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it uh, passes that window but yeah i mean it yeah, makes so sense. there's all That's kinds awesome. of stuff in there there's um mm -hmm. um again all all the the real nuts and bolts of of what went into the book and all the financial tables and um all kinds of good stuff so yeah and i, I have to admit I, I have a little investing chat group and uh, we've definitely sourced from your Oracle's classroom some of those oh, cool. old school Berkshire uh, Hathaway annual reports from the the time like the early '60s before I think Buffett took over. So, yeah, awesome. Oh, that's yeah, great. It, that's it, great. It, you've been uh, an amazing resource, Adam. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, this was uh, this was great to walk through. Yeah, and. and uh, thank you again for walking through all of this information and how to value Berkshire and, and feeling, you know, a sense of confidence that when we try to do this on our own, that we can get to a point of understanding and not just feel overwhelmed that, you know, if there's like too much numbers in the reports and we don't know where to start, because I probably kind of felt like that a little bit until you walked me through, um, you know, the nuts and bolts here. So. I'm deeply appreciative of your time and knowledge, and thank you so much for sharing, Adam. No, you're you're very welcome, Michelle. And and don't just keep going. You know, I mean, I I I continue to learn things about Berkshire, and you know, just keep keep at it, keep reading about it, reading about history, reading about you know current events uh, that's happening with Berkshire, and uh, it's it's something that you really just appreciate the the more you study it, and um, just keep going. It's well worth the effort. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Michelle. All right. Bye. All right. I think I stopped recording.